Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we gather together for our morning devotion. And uh, as we join together today, my daughter Lily told me I have to smile more <laughs> during these things. I, as we uh, gather together uh, to uh, join together for God's blessings, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks uh, for the blessing that you are to us every day. For to God, especially as we go through dark nights of the soul and as we go through difficult times, to God, we know that you are our God and that we are your people. And to God, we pray as we say that almost every day, that dear God, it would be not only fresh in our hearts, but dear God, that you would truly move us to understand how wonderful it is to be a son or a daughter of the living God. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again. <clears throat> we uh, turn today uh, to Psalm 22, 1 uh, for our morning uh, devotion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here we view the Savior in the depth of his sorrows. No other place displays the griefs of Christ like this. And no other moment at Calvary is so full of agony as when his cry rends the air. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? At this moment, physical weakness was united with acute mental torture from the shame and ignominy through which he had to pass. His grief culminated in suffering the spiritual agony beyond all telling that resulted from the departure of his father's presence. This was the black midnight of his horror when he descended into the abyss of suffering. No man can enter in the full meaning of these words. Some of us think at times that we could cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are seasons when the brightness of our Father's smile is eclipsed by clouds in darkness. But let us remember that God never really forsakes us. It is only a seeming forsaking with us. But in Christ's case, it was a real forsaking. We grieve at a little withdrawal of our Father's love. But the real turning away of God's face from His Son, who can calculate how deep the agony that caused Him? In our case, our cry is often dictated by unbelief. In His case, it was the utterance of a dreadful fact. For God had really turned away from Him for a season. Poor, distressed soul who once lived in the sunshine of God's face but now in darkness, remember that he has not really forsaken you. God in the clouds is as much our God as when he shines forth in all the beauty of his grace. But since even the thought that he has forsaken us gives us agony, what must the suffering of the Savior have been when he exclaimed, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Amen. You know, one of the great works of Satan is this attempt to make us think that God leaves us for a time. That in the darkest moments in our life, what is happening is God has just abandoned us to the mercies of this world. But fellow Christians, it's a necessary thing to remind ourselves of what comes next in Psalm 22. As Jesus cries out those words, and as we go back and we read that psalm of David, we are reminded that David, as he went through a difficult day, reminded him that God was faithful to his fathers, that God had remembered the covenant made to Abraham in the days of Moses when the people cried out unto him, that God heard the cries of his people as they wandered in the wilderness, and he provided them with food and water. And brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus has heard our cries and he has sent his Holy Spirit not only to be a comforter to us, but to bring us into his presence that we might not only receive a freshness of his grace, but that we might likewise receive such a blessed reminder of God's love for his children. So even when Satan comes to you and tries to lie unto your soul, that God is Nowhere to be found. Remember that you're in God's hands. And that if God has called your name, there will be no way 
as John 6.37 tells us, that he will ever cast you out. Know with assurance that if God is your God, then you are his child. Let that be great comfort to you both this day and forevermore. Let's turn now to our evening reading from Psalm 28 9. By their shepherd, uh, be their shepherd and carry them forever. God's people need to be carried. They are very heavy by nature. They have no wings, or if they have, they are like the dove of old that lay among the pots. And they need divine grace to make them rise up on wings covered with silver and with feathers of yellow gold. By nature, sparks fly upward, but the sinful souls of men fall downward. O Lord, carry them forever, David himself said. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And here he feels the necessity that other men's souls should be lifted up as well as his own. When you ask for this blessing, do not forget to seek it for others as well. There are three ways in which God's people require to be carried or lifted up. They require to be lifted up in character. Lift them up, Lord. Do not allow your people to be like the rest of the world. The world lies on the wicked one. Lift them out of it. The world's people are looking for silver and gold, seeking their own pleasures and the gratification of their own lusts. But Lord... Carry your people up beyond all this. Cut, keep them from being muckrakers, as John Bunyan calls the man who is always scraping for gold. Set their hearts upon the risen Lord and the heavenly heritage. Moreover, believers need to be carried in conflict, in the battle. If they seem to fall, Lord, be pleased to give them the victory. If the foot of the enemy is upon their necks for a moment, help them to grasp the sword and eventually to win the battle. Lord, lift up your children's spirits in a day of conflict. Do not let them sit in the dust, mourning forever. Do not allow the adversary to disturb their peace and make them free. But if they have been, like Hannah, persecuted, let them sing of the mercy of a delivering God. We may also ask our Lord to carry them at the last. Lift them up by taking them home, carry their bodies from the tomb, and raise their souls to your eternal kingdom in glory. Amen. You know, in the morning portion we read of Christ's cry on the cross, and of course we know that the story of Jesus ends with his resurrection. And we hear in the cries of, uh, of, of Hagar as she sets her boy away from her so she didn't have to hear him scream for water that the Lord heard the cries of the boy and gave water and it's worthwhile for Christians especially to remind ourselves daily that the Lord has us in his hands and as Spurgeon calls it here he lifts us up into his presence you know there's a an old uh, famous uh, uh, painting I guess you would call it uh, that uh, you've probably seen maybe in your grandmother's house uh, that's called the footprints, right? And you know, there's these two sets of pr footprints walking next to each other, and then all of a sudden there's just one set of footprints. And the little uh, saying on the top of it uh, you know, has the guy say, well, where were you, Lord, at that moment? And the Lord responds by saying, I was carrying you. Well, in the Christian life, we are always in the arms of our Father. He is carrying us from the moment of our conversion unto the very end of our earthly lives. And he brings us into the heavenly places. And if it, this was not so, uh, imagine how hard our lives would be if our Lord just kind of left us unto our own uh, power, our own strength. You know, the great comfort of the Christian faith is that we're united by faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will never forsake us nor forget us. And the Lord Jesus knows the depths of our pain, the depths of our anguish, as Romans 8 tells us, the Holy Spirit uh, seeks out the depths of our heart and answers our prayers even before we know we need to pray them. And it's such a, a comfort to know that we have a God like that. And you know, the gods and the nations, you have to go to their temples and you have to offer sacrifices in certain ways in order uh, that they might respond to you. Uh, but Christian worship is the opposite. The Lord our God calls us to worship him 
brings us into his presence and gives us all of the grace and the mercy and the love that we need. And so as we face difficulties today, as we face uh, so much uncertainty in uh, the times in which we live, know that the Lord in his providence has all things in his hands, and most especially that he's carrying you in his hands. May you feel his presence, and may you know his comfort. May the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you today. May you be blessed in every way. Take care.